uh, convene us to, uh, such as it is over 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 Zoom, um, and and welcome you all uh, here to this uh, event of the American Grand Strategy Programs History and International Security uh, Speaker Series with our. Our guest, Tom Schwartz, uh, Distinguished Professor of History at Vanderbilt University. Um, in other times, uh, just a quick jaunt down I-40, uh, and we would have very much loved to have welcomed Tom uh, in person uh, to Duke University, but we're very grateful to Tom for making the time uh, to, to be with us this evening uh, online. Uh, we are uh, both, I guess, coming, coming to you live from our our home offices. Uh, his much less a, uh, a blank void than mine. Um, before, uh, before we get started, I just want to let people know uh, about two events coming up in the Grand Strategy uh, program uh, with Laura Rosenberger on the 22nd of September. That's at 5.30 p.m. also naturally on Zoom, uh, a conversation on preparing for threats to the 2020 election. Uh, and then on the 29th of September, uh, also at 5.30 p.m., a conversation with Ambassador Robert Zellick about his new book, uh, America in the World, a history of US diplomacy and foreign policy. Also on Zoom, the links should be, uh, I hope, uh, coming into your inboxes on a regular basis. Uh, but are also available on the American Grand Strategy Program's uh, webpage. Tana Schwartz uh, from Van of Vanderbilt is the author of, uh, of two books before this one, which we're here to talk about, uh, Lyndon Johnson in Europe, uh, In the Shadow of Vietnam, a story of the Johnson administration, not about the, the one event that often preoccupies and, and maybe diverts, as Tom argues, uh, our attention from other important events in American foreign relations during those years, and also of America's Germany, John J. McCloy and the Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, but he's here today to talk to us about this book, uh, Henry Kissinger and American Power. Um, this was actually the the pre uh, the pre release copy. I was I was fortunate enough to re receive one in, in my home. And Tom, before uh, before I start, I want to ask maybe if you would introduce the book uh, to us to tell us a little bit about uh, about the book. And and if I can press you, I would love to hear in particular why a biography of Kissinger. Uh, if we think about, you know, in whose name trees have been felled, uh, Henry Kissinger has much to atone for, uh, and uh, perhaps in other senses too, if, if you will. I'd love to get your take, not only about the book, but why the book? Why Kissinger? Why now? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here, Simon. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I was going to start, actually, with the book's origins, because it does have sort of an interesting origin story. Um, I had written a review uh, that Louis Mazur, who was the editor at the Reviews in American History at the time, had seen, and he told me about a new series that Helen Wang, a commercial press, was doing. I had published with academic presses, but um, as, uh, as many academics these days uh, see, it's nice, it's not a bad idea to go with a commercial press. You might actually make a little money. Um, but this series had a nice advance. It had other things to it, but it was a series of biographies. But the point of the biography was to teach a particular subject in American history. And the idea was that biography is more appealing than usually sort of books on a topic. And they wanted a proposal from someone on a biography that could teach American diplomatic, modern American diplomatic history, foreign relations, the general subject of America's role in the world. Well, I got a lot of advice on different characters that I might pick, but I ended up being drawn to Henry Kissinger. Um, he had a career that spans six decades, when you think about it. I mean, it is a long career in American foreign relations. Uh, from the first time his book uh, was published, uh, Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, back in August of 57. So my goal was to write a book accessible to the, to the larger public, but also to scholars that would try to use Henry Kissinger's career and life as a way of talking about American foreign policy and the history of American foreign policy. Um, 
when I told Kissinger this, I told him I was going to do a short and concise book, and he looked at me and said, but you will leave things out. And I did leave things out. It is not, I, the book has been, I tried at one point to, to get a two volume study. Uh, my editors did not want that. They wanted one book. It's bigger than it was, but it's also, it, it is also an attempt to get at an argument. And that's where the book is. So the, and, and give me a couple minutes. I'll just say something about the argument in the chapters and then we can move on. Uh, the argument is that most scholars have approached Kissinger by giving priority to his ideas about foreign policy, seeing him as a practitioner of realpolitik, uh, which Kissinger himself defines as a foreign policy based on calculations of power in the national interest. And it's a type of foreign policy that largely eschews moral or idealistic considerations. And one of Kissinger's favorite words was the necessity of approaching foreign policy in a cold-blooded or realistic fashion. I argue not that this is wrong, that other scholars have been wrong, but that it's incomplete. My book tries to look at Kissinger as a political actor, someone who recognized that American foreign policy is fundamentally shaped and determined by the struggles and battles of American domestic politics. Now, the Germans would call this the primat der Innenpolitik, um, and I think this is the approach that I think gives my book at least a different take on Henry Kissinger from many other studies. Kissinger loved to portray himself as above politics. Uh, from his first national television interview in July of 1958, which is available on YouTube, um, you could find it uh, uh, on there, but he was interviewed by Mike Wallace, the famous CBS news, newscaster. Um, Kissinger argued he was an independent, that he was a nonpartisan. He provided his wisdom and advice on foreign policy uh, without partisan consideration. In the Vanderbilt Television News Archive, which served me as a very important source for seeing Kissinger's media role in the, uh, this period, he told Dan Rather at the 1972 Republican Convention, uh, Rather asked him whether a P Vietnam peace settlement would help the president's reelection. Kissinger looked at Rather and said, the president never talks to me about domestic politics. This was nonsense. Uh, we know from the Nixon tapes, the two men often discuss domestic politics, and its implications for foreign policy, especially about Vietnam, where Kissinger argued for the importance of some type of decent interval between withdrawal of American forces and the possible collapse of the South Vietnamese government. So therefore, in a way, my book was designed to get at and study how Kissinger, as a practitioner of, of American foreign policy, saw this intersection and this element of American foreign uh, policy being affected by American domestic politics. I was originally going to entitle the book Henry Kissinger and the Dilemmas of American Foreign Policy. But I, I really think, I was there I was uh, nodding to uh, Alexis de Tocqueville's famous argument that democracies are not as, as capable of exercising foreign policy as aristocracies because they, they lack speed and secrecy and resolve. And I argued Nixon and Kissinger largely overcame that. Um, they got off to a rocky start. Their initial years were not very successful. But in the second part of Nixon's first term, they had a very successful foreign policy. Uh, the famous trifecta, the opening to China, uh, detente with the Soviet Union, the first major nuclear weapons agreement, and a peace treaty with, in Vietnam. When Kissinger gave his famous press conference a week and a half before the 1972 presidential election, one of the first times he was allowed to speak actually on camera. Um, he had been restricted because the Nixon administration was afraid his German accent would be off-putting to the American people. Um, Nixon called him up after the pieces at hand press conference and they talked about its effect on politics. And Kissinger said to him, Colson tells me we've wiped McGovern out now. And th that sense of politics, um, what I call the marriage between geopolitical realism and domestic politics was very successful yielding a landslide victory for Nixon in 1972. Well, Nixon had compromised that victory somewhat by the Watergate scandal, um, which emerged prominently in 1973, but had the ironic effect of, of elevating Henry Kissinger to a very important and powerful position in American foreign policy that I chronicle as he largely acts, as I call it, the president for foreign policy during 1973 and 74. Um, this brings me to one of the key areas I do explore, namely Kissinger's role in Middle Eastern diplomacy, where he uh, was a mediator in the Yom Kippur War, and then followed that up with shuttle diplomacy uh, between Egypt and Israel and um, Israel and Syria. Um, Kissinger's significant contribution there, I think, is something that uh, I, I do point out as one of the most important legacies of his uh, role at the time. 
After Nixon's resignation, Kissinger continued to serve an important role in foreign policy, um, almost seeing President Ford as his partner rather than his boss. Um, but there would be, of course, a reckoning in the latter period. The fall of Saigon, uh, the Middle East peace process slowed, the uh, uh, Soviet Union and Cuba were adventurous in, in Southern Africa. Kissinger found himself attacked by both the left and the right for the type of foreign policy he exercised. Kissinger tried to justify it by, I think, talking in very sophisticated ways about the limits of American power and trying to get Americans perhaps to see beyond, you might say, partisanship and the, the, uh, the, the types of, of slogans that uh, were being used against him to recognize uh, some of the complexities of carrying out foreign policy. But at the same time, there was always a tension in Henry Kissinger that at the same time he talked about the limits of power, he also sought opportunities to exercise American power, both in the Middle East and then later in Southern Africa, where he took on the role trying to mediate a solution to the Rhodesian Zimbabwe majority rule issue uh, toward the end of the Ford administration. Kissinger left office in January of 1977 at the age of 53. I think no one thought he would never come back into a formal office, but he didn't, in part because he scared other presidents who didn't want to bring him in because he had overshadowed, so overshadowed President Ford and Nixon that they kept him at arm's distance, although they li listened to him. And he uh, created a company, Kissinger and Associates, that was involved in foreign policy. He was a, a, a leading media figure on American foreign policy in the 80s and 90s and even into the 2000s. Um, in the end, Kissinger um, continued to have great influence in foreign policy from this media role. And um, I think his legacy remains a, a, a central one to, to look at for uh, any discussion of American foreign policy. And, and indeed, you, you see him all over uh, cable news, et cetera, even, even, even now, even as you say, uh, almost uh, four decades since- uh, six, since Well, six time. decades, honestly, uh, in, in the sense of it, I mean, he was becoming a, public intellectual in 1957. His book was yeah. a bestseller and he was, he was out there. And uh, it is really extraordinary the degree to which he has uh, over all that time. Now, he obviously has been controversial, but he's still mm -hmm. been very much um, someone uh, whom the public listens to or um, other elites listen to. So let me, let me pick up actually on, on one point you made. Um, one thing I was struck by as I, as I, was reading the book um, and also as I was uh, reading the footnotes, uh, which is how you know you're talking to a professional historian when they <laughs> casually discuss reading the footnotes. It's something and I, I see some of my students in the participants list, something I exhort them to do um, as well, is, is how much you have relied on uh, the, not the paper archival record, uh, not only the paper archival record, I should say, uh, but also the video archival uh, record. And you mentioned that one wonderful repository of these things is right there. Right there, uh, yes. At Vanderbilt <laughs> University. But can I get you to talk a little bit about how, as a researcher, television fit in your work, but also Kissinger's time in office and rise to power also coincides with the rise of television in, uh, in everyday American life. I, I, I confess that obviously the Vanderbilt Television News Archive, which I've, I've been at Vanderbilt for 30 years and, and I have exploited it in all sorts of teaching opportunities to talk about uh, the Vietnam War, for example, or other, other issues, how they come about. Um, what people have to remember and what you need to to sort of emphasize to your students is the media environment when the Vanderbilt Television News Archive began with the three networks. That was how most Americans got their news. Um, this was something a lot of people criticized because they thought television was fairly superficial, but it was no, by, by, the, by the mid 1960s, television was the principal way most Americans got their news. Newspapers were still important, but television was the principal way and they got to be these three network newscasts. And, in that sense, um, it was an environment in which you could see a type of consensus much more than the way we see um, news environments today that are quite partisan and people watch it for their own particular viewpoint to have expressed. And in that way, uh, watching Kissinger emerge as a, a dominant public figure during the period 
which happens slowly. I mean, he's introduced to the American people, but he's in the background for the first couple of years of the Nixon administration. The trip to China changes a lot of that. Um, he becomes somewhat of a celebrity diplomat, uh, someone who's followed. Um, Kissinger nurtures some of that with his uh, uh, a private life or a, a, a life with uh, where he dates actresses and, and starlets and things like that. And he's seen as this sort of a figure, a celebrity figure within the Nixon administration, um, an, an unusual playboy, to put it mildly, since his looks and, and other things didn't actually bring that into mind. But it, it all contributes to a certain um, personal um, power for him or personal celebrity status for him. And it comes out on the news and you can see it develop over time and you see him becoming gradually much more the spokesperson for American foreign policy and explaining American foreign policy. Now Kissinger nurtured that. Kissinger nurtured his media role. He spent a lot of time with journalists. He talked to journalists extensively. Uh, one of his aides estimated it was 25 to 50 percent of his time was spent talking to journalists. Um, so this was a, an interesting element. He understood in a sense the media environment, both newspapers and television, but he did understand television. Television news treated him very sympathetically mm -hmm. and um, uh, I think that became a, a source and part of his power, and uh, that's part of the reason I wanted to chronicle it. And you begin, I think, each, every single chapter with a, a wonderful kind of vignette about his appearances uh, and how they, how he's, uh, his success, really, in, in, in mm -hmm. using television, not only, uh, as you say, to get across American foreign policy, but also to get across his role. Yes. In, in American yes. uh, foreign, foreign policy. Um, I'm always really wary about, about deep uh, kind of psychoanalysis biographies, which mm -hmm. attribute pivotal event, a pivotal or maybe not pivotal, but perceived or arguably pivotal event uh, in an individual's childhood. Uh, attribute that, you know, major later events to, to this one episode. Um, and, and if I recall correctly, Kissinger is too, right? He's, yes, yes. I'm not sure if this is in one of your interviews with him or if you quote him, but he says that there's really basically nothing you need to know about me from my, mm -hmm. from my, from my early life that, that makes my later life make more sense. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I just wonder if I could ask you as, as now one of his biographers, uh, do you agree with with Kissinger's sentiment there, or do you find some uh, some episodes in his his pre professional life, let's say, which give us some purchase on understanding his career? Well, I don't think I, I think it's not being excessive. I I share your view of um, of over psychoanalyzing a figure that you can't put on a couch and, and do that. You know that this or over interpreting one or two episodes in one's life as a, for explanatory purposes. But obviously, uh, this is a man who was a German Jew who faced discrimination, who faced uh, being put into exile uh, when he was 15 years old. This is a, that, that is a, 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 an event that has an impact on a person um, to be a displaced like that, to be forced to go to a large city and across the ocean uh, to suddenly have to reestablish himself to be um, to be recentered, um, Kissinger himself has disdained some of the, the the cheaper psychoanalysis, but he himself admits that what had been secure in his life, in terms of of his life in in Germany and in Firth with his parents and his brother, um, suddenly was uncertain. That, that was all changed, and he ends up then coming um, to the United States and has to deal as an immigrant. And, and be an immigrant in this society that well, America was not necessarily very friendly to immigrants in the 1930s. Uh, I think uh, that we, we sometimes forget that this was not a period when immigration was seen as, well, we shouldn't forget since we've, we, 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 we've gone through similar points recently, but it was a, a, there was a sort of hostility as well. And I think Kissinger had to adapt to that. And then of course, obviously the idea that he would go back to Germany as a, a young man a part of the US military and be involved in that. Uh, so I do think there are elements of his earlier life that do play a role in thinking about how he got where he did. And that I think is, is uh, I, don't, uh, I, I don't make any claims there. Um, I have looked at a lot of material, but obviously Neil Ferguson's first volume of his biography had a lot more depth and was um, able to access a lot more of the records 
of Kissinger's personal life during that time, and I relied also on that. So you mentioned his need to kind of adapt to a new society. Mm -hmm. And uh, new life, right? Um, new language, new new culture. Um, I think he his his parents moved to heavily German Jewish kind of neighborhoods in in New York. In New York City, in, yes. In, it's borough, yeah, Greater New York City. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm I'm also struck by the fact that he seems to have spent the kind of definitive years, or some of the definitive years of his life as one half of an odd couple. Uh, and I'm wondering if, if, if maybe this experience being an immigrant made him very good at this. But you know, first, you have the odd couple of, of Henry Kessinger and, and Nelson Rockefeller, mm -hmm. kind of the, the archetypal patrician, the closest thing to an aristocrat as exists in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Kissinger, the graduate student, I think, at the beginning of their relationship, you know, heavily, you know, speaking with a, a pronounced accent. Uh, and then, of course, Nixon and Kissinger. Yes. Nixon, who, Richard Nixon, who definitely hated kind of East Coast elites and was at least to a certain extent anti Semitic or, or comfortable relying on anti Semitic tropes in, mm -hmm. in, in, moments of acute tension. Um, and Henry Kissinger, who was an East Coast elite Harvard professor, you know, Semite. Um, yeah. why, why do you think it is that, that, that Kissinger keeps on finding himself in these, in these unexpected to some pairings? Um, well, again, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to get too psychological about this, but there is there is a way in which Kissinger did seek out mentors from a very early position. I mean, one of the tragedies Kissinger observed in the expulsion from Germany was the collapse of his father, um, who had a prestigious position and lost everything and really sank into a type of depression. Uh, it's, it's a little facile to say he was looking for other father type figures, but Fritz Kramer, for example, who becomes his uh, mentor in Germany and, and, and then helps him or guides him to go to Harvard and and be in, and he finds that there he finds William Yandel Elliott, who also then comes to serve something of that role. So Kissinger became very good at being a uh, a mentee and uh, being able to work with people who oftentimes may have had attitudes that he didn't agree with, but he um, could uh, adapt and learn from. And uh, to a certain extent, this was a relationship that he cultivated. He was very good you might say, of being a mentee who could manipulate and who could mm -hmm. also work uh, his way with people who are more powerful um, and uh, gradually both win their respect and also get them to do things or uh, encourage them in ways that he wanted to see happen. Um, uh, he certainly became very, very good with Rockefeller, who admired him and respected him and largely turned over most of his foreign policy thinking to, K to Kissinger. Um, and... Uh, I think Richard Nixon saw in that, uh, saw someone who could, I mean, Nixon had his own foreign policy ideas, but he saw someone who could be very effective at exercising them and carrying it out. And, uh, and, and Kissinger was willing to put up with a lot. Um, that, that is something that is clearly, uh, comes in the tapes, his willingness to second some of Nixon's prejudices. Uh, he, he, I do, um, unfortunately, bring out some of the more cringeworthy moments of, of the relationship where Kissinger did flatter Nixon excessively, where he uh, sort of tried to show Nixon how cold-blooded he could be with comments. So I, I'm a, I, I see all of that, but I also recognize how Kissinger was pursuing his own interests in all of these relationships as well. And relationships which served him well. I mean, it, yes. it, 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 it must yeah. be said that yeah. uh, it worked. Uh, yes. uh, you know, it, his, uh, it, it is, you know, some of the, there are passages in there where, you know, you, you sort of, your skin crawls a little bit at, at yeah. the, you know, the effusive kind of saccharine or, as you say, cold-blooded kind of, these, these very strange lines which speak to, I, I wonder, you know, maybe, 
I'd invite you to disagree with me, but but seems to me to speak to you know, a pretty volatile concoction of self-confidence and self-assuredness, but also insecurity and self-doubt. Yeah, I think that's there certainly, and I think he knew. He knew um, certainly um, one of the things Kissinger recognized was Nixon's intense insecurity. Yes. And that was the reason for the phone calls after every speech for this was the best speech you've ever given, Mr. President. This was the, you know, this is the best, all of that sort of thing. And Kissinger himself, there was some insecurity, but it, it, with Kissinger, it's a little different. And there's certainly some elements there, but he, he's also intensely uh, aware of his intelligence and his, his, his brilliance. Uh, and, and of course, used a certain amount of self-deprecating humor to take the edge off of that, but nevertheless was certainly aware of that. And uh, certainly, I think that was something he could use with journalists, particularly, um, where I think they were often intimidated by his intelligence, but also enjoyed his wit and his charm. And he is a, you know, what is about Henry Kissinger is that he, he both has a great sense of humor, or at least a, it's somewhat more than at times, but he's also extremely charming. And he, he carried that off very effectively. I think, with many of the people he dealt with. So some people who definitely did not find Henry Kissinger charming uh, were those who worked for him. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yes. and I'm thinking about, uh, you know, browbeaten National Security Council staffers. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm certainly thinking, I'm probably mostly thinking actually about just about the entire professional foreign service uh, of, of the of the United of the United States, and how do you understand uh, Kissinger's? Some have called this distrust. Uh, some have you know used other used other words like circumventing or what or what have you. Uh, but Kissinger's attitude and approach to the uh, shared by Nixon uh, to the professional kind of civil service bureaucracy of foreign policy. Uh, while he was in power? Well, I think in part one has to see this as connected to Nixon's goal to bring foreign policy into the White House and in effect to circumvent the State Department or at least to, to keep the State Department out of the processes of deliberating, deciding, and then undertaking actions in foreign policy that were designed both to score foreign policy success, but also domestic political success, that were designed to, to make sure that foreign policy success went to the credit of the president, not to the State Department, not to the Secretary of State or anyone else. And I think, of course, Nick, Kissinger was Nixon's tool in that. He was the national security advisor. His loyalty was to the president. He carried that out. I think he, I think he, I, I would probably slightly disagree that he did, he did manage when he became Secretary of State to uh, secure a fair amount of loyalty from many of the State Department figures who did appreciate what he was trying to do um, in foreign policy uh, when he becomes Secretary of State. But by that point, of course, Nixon is out of the picture, or at least weakened, and then it, it, it's a very different environment. But I, I do think, I do think this um, is in part a reflection of of the political purposes to which foreign policy was going to be used by the Nixon administration and why they wanted to, uh, in a way, uh, Kissinger was a disruptor. It's, I hesitate to say that because of course people are gonna think of Donald Trump and all of this sort of stuff, but there was a disruptive element to the Nixon administration. They wanted to change certain policies. They wanted to change policies toward China, which, was, which had a strong constituency in the State Department that leaned the other way, this sort of thing. So that it, there were going to be um, difficult points in that. Um, so. Uh, I do think that that did make it harder in some ways for him to develop good relationships with many of the members of the Foreign Service. And, and it, we talked a little bit earlier about his relationship with the press, which, which mm -hmm. also kind of flourished, uh, accelerated by television. But for, for those of us whose frame of reference for Henry Kissinger is definitively in his post-official uh, you know, post capacity, uh, you know, absent, I, he did a small thing for the, I guess, the Reagan administration. Right. He, and he directed the 9-11 commission for a week or something. Yeah, about a week. Yeah, it wasn't very long. Um, it is, it's, it's, it's easy to kind of see the picture of, you know, Kissinger as the latter-day Metternich 
uh, you know, the, the shrewd foreign policy kind of conservative with a, of a kind of more of a European bent conservative uh, kind of approach. It is much more difficult to uh, see Henry Kissinger's sex symbol. <laughs> um, and, you know, super K uh, <laughs> and, and things like that. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, the I guess the, the current language for it would be the public diplomacy efforts uh, of Henry Kissinger and, and why in 1970s uh, America, this image of you know, the national security advisor as sex symbol had traction and, and actually resonated with, with, with the American public? Well, I think Kissinger benefited um, in part from the fact that the Nixon administration's general cabinet and that were fairly colorless figures. They were, they, they, Kissinger was in, in what we might call now, he was diversity. Um, he, was, he was foreign, he was Jewish, uh, he was an academic. This was very different from the, you might say, the advertising executives, the, 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 the people who look like men in white color, or white, in their, in their uh, suits um, and all the rest. And he, he did seem different. And I think uh, his story was particularly interesting. It was a sort of both Horatio Alger and also only in America uh, could someone like Henry Kissinger rise to that position. And there was a, uh, there's a, a, Kissinger when he was uh, sworn in as Secretary of State made that comment that only in America could a man of my circumstances have reached this point. And I think the press was enthralled by that. That was the, the there was this element of seeing uh, someone uh, who seemed to reflect the best about America, the, the, the sort of American exceptionalism that people were beginning to have a lot of doubts for. I mean, the 1970s is also a period of great internal doubting. Um, Vietnam more than Watergate, this would all lead to a, a great deal of repercussions there. The, uh, in Nixon's second inaugural speech, in fact, um, I was recently asked to, to, to look at it and, and uh, to write something about it. And I was struck by the fact that he talks about how American schools are teaching bad things about the United States, that they're very negative about the United States. This is in 1973, January of 73, he's saying this. I think Kissinger in a way looked, yeah, it, it, it's a very interesting. The Vietnam War, we forget sometimes how, how damaging the war was and the, and the racial unrest and, and the war of that time for American idealism. And Kissinger, in a way, sort of gave a sense, here is someone doing this, and then his activities, and you mentioned the super K, and that, that came out of the shuttle diplomacy and the idea that here was an American who seemed to be making peace in the Middle East. Um, it's, uh, it's a temptation that lots of presidents like, making peace in the Middle East. It's still a temptation. And uh, Kissinger seemed to be really doing it at the time. So it, and, and he, of course, had been uh, the negotiator in Paris with the Vietnam peace talks, although that in many respects, we now know worked out less successfully, of course, but at least he had played that role as well. So it was a, it was really kind of, he, he fit a, a, a certain need for the public, I think, to see, but at the same time, he also, he cultivated it. He, uh, he, uh, he cultivated journalists. He had a lot of friends among journalists um, and um, he, he did it very well. And is that how you make sense of his this pretty extraordinary, the pretty extraordinary fact that he manages to survive Watergate, mm -hmm. despite having been, you know, involved in some wiretapping things. There's an extraordinary. I think it's just a couple of pages in the book, which I really found, which which I was by which I was really taken aback, uh, where you talk about some of Kissinger's friends, and also some of his not so friends. Uh, all saying, basically, you know, we need to save Kissinger, we need to protect Kissinger, we need to, you know, keep this, uh, we need to keep this away from him. Mm -hmm. That's actually, I think, one of the points I, I, I really want to stress is that um, this was a, it was a design strategy to, to keep him from being implicated, because Nixon believed uh, at first because Agnew was his vice president, but even after when Gerald Ford becomes his vice president, that uh, impeachment would not move ahead if the Democrats in Congress thought they were replacing him with someone who could not handle foreign policy. Um, and so Kissinger's role in foreign policy, which was the great shining success uh, 
that even most Democrats at the time admitted um, was something that he thought would save him. Of course, the irony was that it, it, it elevated Kissinger, but it made Nixon expendable. And that's one of the, the interesting aspects of, uh, of the, the irony of Nixon's choice in that. But he did, I think he did think, uh, Nixon did uh, believe that if he allowed Kissinger to continue to carry out diplomacy, that this would be something that would affect Congress's uh, determinations about impeachment. And it didn't, of course, but uh, that, was, that was his miscalculation. So it, it would be remiss of me, you know, while we're talking about Kissinger's time in office, uh, not to raise, for example, uh, the bombing of Cambodia, mm -hmm. uh, the, the human consequences of which we know were, were, were absolutely catastrophic. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, uh, the very serious successes uh, in US-China relations, uh, perhaps a little bit more fleetingly uh, in arms control uh, talks with the Soviet Union. Um, as someone who's kind of trying to take the broad view and get the, the big picture of, of, of the man and uh, your, at the front of the book, uh, it's described as the definitive biography of Henry Kissinger, which which I believe to be, uh, you know, a fair claim, uh, but then an M dash, uh, at least for those who neither revere nor revile him, uh, which I think is a wonderful tagline, um, which uh, gets me gets me thinking. How do you make sense of these big extremes, uh, not only in terms of outcome, uh, right, but also kind of you know normative. Yes. Uh, extremes? Well, look, I, I, I want to say that uh, some of the things written about your book are usually done by your publicists and you know you don't really do them and so sometimes the claims are a bit more. I, I think within the book I try to recognize and I, I think I actually say explicitly that this is an intervention into what I believe will be an argument without end about Henry Kissinger, that there is not you know, the, uh, my intervention is to, to make at least, uh, to, to try to use him as a way of understanding American foreign policy, how it's made, its, its, its strengths, its weaknesses, uh, because of this element of domestic um, and foreign that uh, we now understand much more fully, I think, or we should understand much more fully, but to recognize that there is a, something of a balance sheet there. Um, the Cambodian issue, Chile, uh, South Asia. I mean, Kissinger has you know, Kissinger was someone who also personalized foreign policy. So all of these mistakes seem his responsibility, which I also argue is 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 a bit excessive as well. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, um, I fully recognize that uh, my balance sheet on this, and I think Kissinger's, which was largely centered, I think, around the sense what the most important thing was the survival and security of the United States the degree to which the administration lessened the danger of nuclear war and the danger of a, 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 catastrophe, a, a catastrophe of that nature, that was good. That was a good thing. Um, and uh, yes, there would be other um, consequences and that did lead to decisions that I think were regrettable and mistaken. Um, and I make that point about Chile, I make that point about South Asia. But that's, I think in, in general, I think one has to see something of a balance sheet. I think. Foreign policy is, and, and here I would um, agree with Kissinger, that it is often the choice between the lesser evils. Um, it is not always a positive choice. There are also dilemmas in foreign policy, which we see even today, about dealing with autocratic regimes, how much to stress human rights, all of these things. So in that sense, I, I recognize that mine is an intervention and an argument without end, and I, I do understand that point. And, uh just picking up on uh, on that, you know, the book's the book's title is Henry Kissinger and American Power, mm -hmm. um, and uh, if I can continue torturing the balance sheet metaphor, um, <laughs> okay. what's interesting is that you know he excoriates Eisenhower and even Truman for having squandered mm -hmm. uh, American power, uh, and and then in in office maybe you disagree with me, but it seems that uh, 
the trajectory of American power during Henry Kissinger's time in office is a downward uh, trajectory. It's he's not rebuilding it. He's maybe fighting to hold on to some. Um, how do you how do you kind of make sense of this official who was really focused on you know, power politics? I mean, he if you look if I looked in my dictionary, I would half expect to see Henry Kissinger's face as the illustration for the you know the encyclopedia entry for power politics. And yet, on his on his watch, American power declined in some ways quite sharply. Um, how do you make sense of that, Tom? Well. Um, I would go back a little bit to the, the argument about the influence of domestic politics and recognizing that um, anyone who became president in 1969 was going to face the challenge of the retrenchment of American power. Richard Nixon, I think, recognized that even though he resisted it very much as well because he wanted to exercise that power. Uh, the Nixon doctrine, though, was about empowering surrogates uh, for that responsibility. You're right to say during that time there was this sense that America was retreating. Kissinger tried to resist that in certain ways. I mean, he, uh, one of the things Kissinger said is by, by opening to China, that was a creative measure that gave the United States greater flexibility in international relations, put it in a position where it could be a balancing uh, the triangular diplomacy between China and the Soviet Union but also his insertion into the Middle East, moving away, you might say, from Southeast Asia into the Middle East. And then even at the end of uh, the time, he was there going into Southern Africa in, in a very uh, uh, strength, uh, strong way. So it, it's, it's interesting. Kissinger faced and one that he recognized was that the American people had no appetite for the type of foreign policy that John Kennedy had said, will pay any price, bear any burden. That was not there anymore. And, and in that sense, I think um, Nixon and Kissinger had to face that issue. And then the question was, how did they do it? And it, in some ways they did it creatively, in other ways they did it tragically. And, and I, I think that's what I would get at from that. Let me ask uh, about the post, the post uh, kind of Ford administration uh, years. Um, I, I, I loved your, I think it's the seventh chapter on the kind of curious career of Henry Kissinger, former uh, Secretary of State, former uh, National Security Advisor. And, and, you know, certainly when it comes to among your many interventions, I think this is one of the major ones is thinking seriously about Kissinger post, uh, you know, post his, his tenure in in, in government, I, I found that I found that really really interesting, um, and I wonder to you uh, what explains this uh, extraordinary uh, kind of ongoing uh, prominence in the foreign policy conversation without official prominence. Right, I'm sure a lot of people uh, watching this will have read George Packer's biography of Richard Holbrook, mm -hmm. a man who, you know, as soon as he was out of government, was conniving to get back into government, uh, and you know, taking some pretty extraordinary steps uh, in order to do that. Kissinger, it seems, did the opposite of that um, in in his kind of total lack of interest almost, it seems, in, a, in another government post. Uh, and yet he enjoyed extraordinary, and yet he enjoyed extraordinary prominence, even as people were, you know, like, how could I put this? Uh, he was not necessarily the safe invite to a college campus to talk about foreign policy. Right. Uh, in the sense that you know, there would be people who would take great uh, exception. Uh, to, to featuring him. So how do you make sense of the extraordinarily long, extraordinary longevity of Henry Kissinger's kind of stature uh, on foreign affairs? Well, first off, I'd, I'd have to say that he thought he was going to get back. And I think during the Carter years, I think he thought he was going to be back when the Republicans got back in. In the 1980 Republican convention, I mean, one of the reasons he was hoping that Reagan would pick Ford as his vice president, and that was a deal breaker um, uh, for, for, for Reagan that he just couldn't because Ford wanted to bring along Kissinger. So he, was, uh, he, he did try to get back uh, for a time. Um, I think he was deeply disappointed. 
that when George Bush became president in 1988 that he didn't bring in. He brought in a number of Kissinger's uh, students or uh, people like um, uh, Lawrence Eagleburger or others who had worked with Kissinger and that, but he didn't bring Kissinger back. Um, so in a way, it's not completely uh, accurate to see him as, as, complete, as, as getting out. He, he still wanted to play a role. And I think he also then played a role, this, of course, this media role where he became a, a chief uh, opinion maker on foreign policy, both through writings and then through uh, media appearances that he did cons consistently throughout the, uh, the 1980s into the 1990s and early 2000s. In the 2000s, of course, he was, uh, I mean, he's quite, remember, he's quite old at this point, but he's, he's and he's still quite old, but he was brought in uh, by uh, George uh, W. Bush, who, who uh, liked Kissinger more, uh, attempted to appoint him to the 9-11 committee, but Kissinger didn't want to divest of the knowledge of Kissinger and Associates, the business firm that had really made him millions and gave him uh, access to foreign policy issues around the globe, too. So there's, it, it's a complicated story of Kissinger on the one hand trying to preserve a certain amount of access and influence, at the other hand also wanting to make a lot of money and to, to have a role that way too. Um, and I try to depict it. He becomes, of course, as the records come out, he becomes more controversial. Um, and many of the things in his memoirs are attacked and he becomes a, a figure and many of the, on, on the left, especially after Christopher Hitchens, uh, goes after him that is, is, is quite uh, uh, toxic. Uh, but he does try to retain uh, that influence and, and certainly um, uh, had a fair amount of success at it, in at least the first two decades or so afterwards, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little bit longer uh, with George W. Bush, but not, uh, not much after that. It's, uh, yeah, it was certainly interesting, you know, when in the 2008 election, he, he crops up, 2012, I mean, I mean, it's still kind of a, a name which which is currency in, in, in foreign policy and means being taken seriously uh, even even now in, in 2020 which is which is which is quite a, quite extraordinary so I, I have one more question for for you Tom but I want to mm -hmm. uh, invite the audience uh, to to raise their hands uh, using the the zoom raise hand feature uh, please and uh, go ahead and start doing that so we can we can build up a a list of, uh, of, of questions before I turn, turn it over to you. I just want to ask Tom, you know, because uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of students uh, in, in the audience, um, and I wonder, as, as they think about Henry Kissinger, and they think about a very uncertain world uh, into which they're going to head off and, and you know, work, in, work in, in, in public policy, um, to them, what would you say they should learn uh, from the professional uh, career of, of, of Kissinger as, a, as an American foreign policymaker at a time which looks not dissimilar to the very late 1960s in, in a lot of ways? Well, this is a tough one. That's a uh... Uh, I mean, I think sometimes um, we see Kissinger as essentially successful because of his ideas and certainly his intellectual firepower and the rest certainly was very much a part. But it was also a recognition that the politics of foreign policy in the American context also rests on uh, the cooperation, the support of the American people. And in that sense, rebuilding a foreign policy consensus of sorts um, that recognizes what type of role the United States should play in the world, which is, I think, one of the challenges the Nixon administration really did face after Vietnam and, and with the polarization that war had brought to ideas about foreign policy. In that sense, I think um, uh, Kissinger did succeed in, the, in certain respects, and, and particularly in the Middle East and other places, and, giving Americans a sense that the United States could do things creatively and constructively in diplomacy. And I think, I think that, uh, that domestic foreign connection, the, the idea that foreign policy in the, in, in the American context has to be, uh, it has to be connected to domestic political incentives and, and, and in interests, that idea is, is crucial. That you can, you can have the best foreign policy ideas in the world but if there's no domestic support, they're not going to go anywhere. They're not, they're, they're not going to be successful. And this is, I think, some of the, 
problem with, you might say, some of the more idealistic multilateralism that uh, sort of sees in simple international agreements and other things that solutions when, in a way, you, you've still got, you've got, to, you've got to convince people these things will work, that they'll, they'll be effective, that they won't harm American interests. And in a way, uh, Donald Trump, for all of his faults, has been clarifying with America First by showing, in a way, by, by showing the alternative to the type of liberal world order that people like Kissinger tried to create and, and uh, justify um, and, and sustain. That, and it's, it's an interesting kind of aspect of, of his story that uh, on the one hand, you have the keenly attuned to domestic politics, but on the other hand, in many senses, that's his undoing and the undoing of, of his policies, right? Of, of, mm -hmm. That Ronald Reagan was able to harness an anti-detente, you know, mood. Obviously, a mm -hmm. lot of other factors that contributed yeah. to Reagan's election, yeah. um, but that 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 he was able to hand, harness resentment or a dissatisfaction with Kissinger, and as as being a, a kind of a key uh, element of his his foreign policy platform in in 1980, and then appoint a Kissinger protege <laughs> as his. <laughs> Secretary of State. Now we know how not well that went. Um, yeah. That's enough for that's enough for me. I want to I want to invite uh, some of our, our guests to to pose their questions, and I'm going to start with uh, Daniel Billings. Uh, hi, thank thank you very much for that. Um, I just had a question about um, about Kissinger's kind of behind the scenes impact on U.S. China relations more recently. Um, I know he's considered a bit of a rock star in, in China at the moment, and I was just wondering what what, what impact you, you you think he's had um, on U.S.-China relations within the past decade, um, and whether you think he uh, he had less influence under the Obama administration than under the Bush administration. Um, that's a good question. Um, it's hard to answer that, um, and uh, you know I won't I won't immediately defer to my historical or historians cap on that because we don't have documents. We don't have, in a sense, the measure of it. My sense is, of course, that Kissinger did have more influence with uh, George W. Bush, and particularly Condoleezza Rice did talk with him frequently about China issues. Um, and, and the Bush administration, particularly North Korea, for example, they were trying to get, Kissinger did some trips to China where he talked about the issue of North Korea and nuclear weapons program. I don't think Kissinger has had much influence in more recent times. I mean, I, I do think he's more of a symbol now uh, of U.S.-China relations. He himself has talked about how we, seems to be, we seem to be in the foothills of a new Cold War. And I think in that sense, he's issued some warnings about uh, uh, where U.S.-China relations are going. But I'm not sure that he's really listened to in any uh, way um, currently or in more recent times. Um, he did play a role, I think, in uh, U.S.-China relations uh, after, uh, particularly during the Reagan administration, where I think he was uh, one of the voices that encouraged Reagan away from Reagan's more pro-Taiwan um, ideas and, and encouraged the continuing interaction with China during the 80s. I think he uh, encouraged uh, the, the World Trade Association um, entry of China. These sorts of things was certainly areas where he was, uh, he favored that policy. Uh, I don't know that he's really had a, a great deal of influence in more recent times, and I think it would be somewhat doubtful, but um, he remains a symbol, you might say, of the U.S.-China relationship. And in that sense, he continues to have what you, you very accurately described as, as a sort of rock star element. It is the one country you go to that there won't be protests against him, and, and that is kind of interesting in that sense as well. There, there might be some other factors impacting the lack of protests uh, in, that, <laughs> yes. in that particular quality tone. Yeah, yeah, that I, I, I but yeah, good point. <laughs> but also, Russia. I mean, he, he, Putin he loves to loves to have yep. meetings with, with yep. Kissinger. Yeah, these are always you know very fulsomely covered on TV, and mm -hmm. uh, he is usually to those only one to two hours late. Uh, as opposed to his customary four to six, yes, uh, yeah, yeah, which yeah. which is instructive. Yeah. Uh, I see. I see next uh, Ben Palmer. Hey, uh, good evening. Uh, 
Mr. Schwartz, thank you so much for your presentation so far. Um, I do have a question. Uh, I think at the beginning you mentioned that um, Kissinger, Kissinger can be seen as can some, some sort of cold-blooded realist. Uh, from your research, did you, did you, could you find out that when he had to be um, following more the idealist approach, uh, if he was struggling with that, or you, you could see that like the idealism and foreign politics wasn't really his his thing or his like uh, main approach? Um, it's interesting you should ask that question. Um, and it, it's, you know, um, I think Neil Ferguson deliberately entitled the first volume of his study of Kissinger, The Idealist, uh, because Kissinger out of power was willing to use, uh, you might say more of this sort of foreign policy idealism as an argument against Eisenhower Kennedy or Johnson policies, if that would serve the interests of Nelson Rockefeller or, uh, in, well, particularly Nelson Rockefeller at that time. So he did have a certain flexibility. This is one of the arguments I make in the book is that he did have his, his adherence to realpolitik and to this notion of a cold-blooded approach to foreign policy um, could be flexible at times when he, when he felt the need to, to make it more flexible. Um, uh, I don't think, uh, I think on the whole, um, he, 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 could, he was flexible in how he handled things. He, he uh, for example, um, when uh, Gerald Ford reversed Nixon's policies on Southern Africa and really put the United States in favor of majority rule, Kissinger was very uh, happy to put this in terms of American idealism and belief in democracy and um, handle it in that manner. So he wasn't, he wasn't averse to that. Um, I think on the whole, he, uh, where he, and at times even um, um, on, an, on another issue altogether, for example, on the Vietnam War, um, when Kissinger advocated uh, a more generous policy toward trying to, to save Saigon toward the end of 1974 and 75, it, one of his arguments was this was a moral case. Uh, so he, he could use that case sometimes and use that rhetoric um, in foreign policy um, in ways that uh, seem to run against the sort of cold-blooded uh, realpolitik uh, idea that is usually associated with him. He and Nixon, though, did love to think of themselves and, and talk about foreign policy in this way. Uh, but at the same time, Nixon was also very sensitive to the political dimensions of foreign policy as well when he needed to be. And mindful of time, uh, it pains me to say we have time for only one one more question, uh, and that'll be from Phil Ma. Uh, hello, and thank you for uh, thank you for your time here today. Uh, I was wondering, so Henry Kissinger is pretty, uh, from what I've read, known for him uh, keeping secrets, especially from the bureaucracy during his mm -hmm. time in office. Um, mm -hmm. How do you think that affected the way his plans for foreign policy and otherwise were implemented um, and whether uh, that had an effect on whether or not uh, his vision of detente and other policies were able to carry further than just the Nixon and the uh, Way Ford administrations. Well, I would, I would make the case that a lot of the secrecy um, was both of course, they were, they were trying to keep th things secret from the bureaucracy a lot of times, along with the American people when they felt uh, on the bombing of Cambodia, for example, but also the great, the great example of um, secrecy in the Nixon administration was the trip to China, uh, Kissinger's secret trip in July of 1971, where they were deliberately keeping it secret. Now, Kiss the, the argument was that this otherwise it would be undermined by the bureaucracy the Chinese actually wanted an open visit. They, they actually said, you can come, this is not, we don't feel the need to have it secret. It's not, you know, we're, we're fine with it being public. But I think there the politics of it were crucial. Nixon wanted to get the maximum political bang for the buck, essentially by surprising and offsetting his critics. We knew would be really, they had been advocating uh, the opening to China, many of his democratic critics. And so to, to be able to use secrecy and then to be able to use it in a way that was politically effective was part of that. And um, uh, so I think secrecy, secrecy played a role politically. Um, some of the secrecy, of course, did, there was a reaction against uh, uh, the Nixon administration, which I think your question really 
uh, refers to that, that in effect there was a backlash against these methods and the, the degree to which foreign policy was kept uh, close to the vest by the Nixon, Nixon and Kissinger and that they excluded others from the process. And I think that certainly is the case by the end of the Ford administration where there's real, uh, a lot of congressional and Senate investigations. And that's that secrecy had advantages, but it also encouraged a backlash that did undermine some of the political support uh, for the administration. And I think on Soviet policy particularly, some of the arrangements and deals became much more sinister because of the secrecy involved and certainly damaged uh, gaining political support for detente. Um, and I, I think it was harmful to the, to the preservation of that policy. Tom, this has been a real treat. Uh, thank you uh, so much for making time uh, to be with us. Folks, once again, the book is Henry Kissinger. I'm trying to not make it glare. Uh, once again, the book is Henry Kissinger. The things we learn how to do on Zoom. Uh, once again, the book is Henry Kissinger and American Power, and it's available wherever books are sold. Um, which, let's be honest, is just one website at this point. Um, <laughs> yes. And it, it remains only for me to, to ask uh, all of you in the audience to, to join me in thanking Tom Schwartz uh, for being with us, thanking Melanie Benson and Beth O'Brien for putting this uh, event together and organizing all of the logistics, uh, and uh, to please join me in thanking uh, all of the above for their, their time and efforts. It's been a really uh, edifying and wonderful conversation, Tom. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. Thank you so much for having me here, and I really, really appreciate it. It's our pleasure. And, and with that, folks, uh, we are adjourned, uh, and we'll see you at the next uh, American Grand Strategy events soon. <laughs>